Hello there and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where every season we select a theme and then find six movies all related to that theme. Then in each episode we take one of these movies and provide you with all sorts of background information on the people who made the movie and all kinds of Hollywood history that you can share with your friends or strangers that you meet on public transportation. I'm Chad Cooper, and along with my co-host and lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, we are happy to bring to you the first episode of Season 16's theme, It's Like Jaws, featuring a half dozen movies that ripped off the original summer blockbuster featuring a shark that terrorizes a beach town in the mid-1970s. It's quite a good movie if you haven't seen it. However, on this podcast, we tend to avoid movies that are quite good, and instead, we take on movies that are quite bad by most accounts. Which brings us to the inaugural episode of this season's theme, a little movie called Grizzly. It's like Jaws, but with a bear, and on land, and not very good. There's no real emotional connection with any of the characters in the film. There's no suspense or tension. The bear isn't that frightening and certainly doesn't tap into any deep psychological fears of the unknown shared by a broader movie-going audience. There's a lot of indoor wood paneling and people smoke cigarettes and they drink booze a lot. So, you know, for some of us, there's a little childhood nostalgia. And you know what? Since I'm the one doing the show introduction, that means Bo's about to come in here and give you the show open. That's going to jam some facts into your brain. Some of them will be fun facts. Some of them will be not so fun facts. You've been warned. So let's quit wasting time and get my co-host in here to tell us all about how the movie Grizzly found its way to theaters and ripped off one of the greatest summer movies of all time. Get in here, bo, 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 start the show. There's a song in the hit musical Hamilton that repeats the line, Why do you write like you're running out of time? It's a line that always struck me as poignant, and it brings to mind an unlikely figure when compared against a founding father like Alexander Hamilton, but a man who embodied the same kinds of passion in many ways. I'm talking, of course, of the director of this episode's movie, William Bill Girdler, and the film Grizzly. Bill was a man who had a very young and deep appreciation that he might, in fact, be running out of time. He was born in 1947, and at the age of only 13, his father, who managed a chemical company in Louisville, Kentucky, died unexpectedly. His father was only 40 years old. His grandfather had died young, too, at the age of 50. So even as a teenager, Bill Girdler would tell friends he'd never make it past 30. There was an urgency in Girdler's life to set his goals and achieve them before the clock ran out. It was all a fantasy, of course, but losing a parent at that age and feeling the weight of a tragedy like that, it makes you think and do crazy things. And the crazy thing that Bill Girdler most wanted to do was to make movies. When he turned 18, Girdler didn't have the money, or time as he saw it, to worry with film school. Instead, he joined the Air Force at 18, he married his high school sweetheart, and then Bill was stationed in California. It was here that he received his first practical experience with movies. When not on duty, Girdler would work on sets of films shooting in the California deserts and television shows like Wild Wild West, among others. When he left the Air Force after his service had ended, he went back home to Louisville and decided to apply his experience from his time on television sets to his own movies. He ended up forming a production company with his brother-in-law and an old friend of his, and Bill and his group of ragtag filmmakers gathered the finest talent they could scrape together for no pay in Louisville, Kentucky, and they made themselves a movie. Asylum of Satan was released onto the world in 1972. It starred a soap opera actress, Carla Borelli, and a local horror movie TV host, 
a bit in the vein of a Sven Gulli or Joe Bob Briggs, a man named Charles Kissinger. Kissinger would go on to star in many of Girdler's movies. Asylum of Satan was produced for around $60,000, but thanks to no real distribution, the movie didn't make much money. Well, distribution was among the issues. It was also a B-grade movie at best, with Satan showing up in an ape costume at the end. But it's undeniably plucky. Girdler is using all kinds of tricks to try to make this cheapo movie work, and he almost pulls it off. For a nut like me who enjoys these homemade horror movies, it's kind of a treat, but not really for more discerning eyes. While the folks who gave Bill money for Asylum of Satan weren't interested in the second movie, having made no money the first go-round, so Bill did something you were never supposed to do when making a movie, he used his own money. His inheritance from his father, along with money from some friends, made up the $30,000 or so used to produce Girdler's sophomore film by the tawdry title of Three on a Meat Hook. Using his spookos pal Charles Kissinger again, Girdler used Psycho as an inspiration for this story of a young man who may have killed women due to being crazy. Or maybe his sinister father has something to do with the titular women and their location on meat hooks. The movie is weirdly subdued for the title and falls more into the psychological horror of Hitchcock than the grindhouse fare that Three on a Meat Hook would suggest. While that makes it stand out in a field of quickie independent horror movies, it doesn't really play well for an audience who expected a quickie independent horror movie. Coupled with further distribution issues, Three on a Meat Hook was a failure. At this point, Bill was out of money. He had no leads in the industry, so he went to work at a car dealership. Living the life of quiet desperation, he so hoped to avoid. He was, after all, running out of time. Frustrated with a life in the automotive sales, Bill Girdler rolled the dice one last time. He put the cans of film from Three on a Meat Hook and Asylum of Satan under his arm, and he drove to Hollywood, where he met with several production houses. His pitch was pretty simple. Look at what I made with no real production budget. Movies, he said, could be made cheaply in Louisville, Kentucky, and he was just the guy to do it. Most studios had no interest in shaving a few dollars off the budget to send a film crew all the way to Kentucky when they had sets and crews in Los Angeles, but one budget-minded company liked the cut of Girdler's jib. David Sheldon and Samuel Arkoff were kings of low-budget fare. Their company, American International Pictures, is responsible for some of the best bad movies of all time. AIP, as it was known, began as American Releasing Corporation, which film buffs will know as the company that released those amazing Roger Corman Poe films in the 1960s. Over time, that became AIP, and they were the champions of genre films like Invasion of the Saucer Men and Operation Dames. Directors like Burt I. Gordon and Burt Topper and Robert Gurney, guys who could make movies on the cheap that still functioned as, you know, movies. And when the good folks at AIP heard about Girdler's inexpensive plans to make movies in Louisville, they hopped on board. And with an actual studio behind him, Girdler was tasked with making an entry in the new and very profitable black exploitation wave of the 1970s. In 1974, Girdler made two black exploitation films for AIP. The first was The Zebra Killer, aka The Git Man. It starred Austin Stoker as a black detective on the trail of a serial killer who turns out to be a white guy in blackface. You may not be surprised to learn that The Zebra Killer did not do all that well at the box office. However, in the same year of 1974, William Girdler would release his second film for AIP, this one a combination of black exploitation and direct ripoff of a little movie called The Exorcist. Now, when The Exorcist was released in theaters in 1973, it became a box office hit and something of an international phenomenon. Anecdotally, I remember my parents talking about viewers coming out of screenings of The Exorcist thinking that they were possessed. That's a hell of a movie, if you'll pardon the pun. Naturally, movie studios wanted a little bit of that action, and William Girdler is responsible for two Exorcist ripoffs, but we'll get to that. His first was Abby, which is 
an unapologetic blend of The Exorcist and the popular blaxploitation movies of the time. The big star was William Marshall, who is the amazing actor that played the title role in Blackula, a movie far better than the silly title suggests. Marshall was a classically trained actor and brings a weight to these genre movies in a really surprising way. Here, he plays the priest squaring off against a possessed Carol Speed, who plays Abby Williams in the movie. Abby is a real scene is believing kind of movie. It's equal parts ridiculous and charming and cheap and wonderful. But when Abby was released, it was a big hit. The kind of hit that draws the attention of a studio like Warner Brothers, the studio that produced The Exorcist. It didn't take long for Warner Brothers attorneys to send a shot across the bow of AIP saying they were feeling litigious and maybe AIP wanted to do something before things got more serious about the fact that they were releasing a movie that seemed an awful lot like the one Warner Brothers had made. A court at the time ruled against Girdler and AIP, and Abby was pulled from theaters after only two weeks while litigation went on. In 1978, courts would ultimately side with Girdler, but he never saw the royalties off this thing. Legit copies of Abby are still hard to come by, but readily available on the internet if you want to see what all the fuss was about, and I kind of don't recommend it, but you should also see Abby. While two weeks of theatrical exhibition sounds slim, it was enough to make Abby's money back and then some, about $4 million. Girdler was, for the first time, a successful film director, and he was running out of time. While the courts battled over Abby, Girdler was wrapping up his contract for the three movies he had agreed to with AIP with a Pam Greer starring film called Sheba Baby. And everyone kind of agrees this was not one of the best Pam Greer movies, but ironically, Girdler made more money for directing Sheba Baby than he would for any other movie, despite the fact that Girdler himself thought it was kind of a weak effort, even for him. With AIP in litigation, Girdler decided to distance himself from the company and strike out on his own. He found money for a thriller called Project Kill, a James Bond-esque tale of assassins starring a very serious Leslie Nielsen before Airplane forever cast him as a comic lead. One of the AIP producers we mentioned, David Sheldon, co-wrote that script and helped Girdler secure financing. David Sheldon would be a longtime partner for William Girdler and co-wrote a lot of the films he made. Unfortunately for everyone involved, William Girdler's bad luck struck again when the head of the company distributing Project Kill was found murdered before the film's release. I know that is a salacious statement, and I wish I had more information on the murder itself, but details are pretty thin in that regard. Nonetheless, the legal dealings with the estate of the now-deceased distributor prevented Project Kill from releasing until 1980. So in 1975, Girdler wanted to head back west from Louisville, Kentucky, but his wife was tired of this life in the circus of movie making, and she and Bill split up. Desperate for some opportunity, Bill wanted to make a movie as big as Jaws, the blockbuster hit of the summer, and he knew somebody was gonna do it. He was the guy who made the ripoff of Exorcist that was so successful, Warner Brothers sued to get it removed. So if somebody was going to rip off Jaws, why not him? For better or worse, Bill Girdler knew how to make a knockoff movie, and he wanted to be the first at theaters. The question was, how do you make Jaws without a shark or, well, money? Part of the answer came from his collaborator, David Sheldon, who had been handed an idea from an old AIP associate who was making a cross-country trip over the summer. Along the way, this associate, a guy named Flaxman, and his family stopped at a campsite, where a ranger there warned them against camping high up in the mountains. It seemed there was a bear roaming around, a pretty big one. And that idea of a giant bear terrorizing campers hung with Flaxman, or so he says. When Jaws became a smash hit, Flaxman said to David Sheldon, hey, how about we write a script about a bear instead of a shark? David Sheldon thought that sounded like a great idea, and the two of them put their heads together. Bada bing, bada boom, we have the script for Grizzly. Warner Brothers was actually interested in the script, wanting a movie to compete with Paramount's Big Smash with Jaws. But Girdler and his team were a little gun-shy about Warner Brothers, what with being sued by them and all. So they set it up as an independent movie with a company called Film Ventures International. 
this would be Girdler's biggest budget to date, to the tune of almost a million dollars, and it featured a cast of kinda known actors, if not outright stars. Christopher George would play the Head Ranger, an analog to the Roy Scheider role from Jaws. George started with television not long after high school, and he graduated to movies where he first met his childhood hero, John Wayne, on the set of In Harm's Way, a pretty good submarine actioner. When he met the Duke again for Howard Hawke's El Dorado, John Wayne and Christopher George struck up a friendship that would last until the end of their lives. Christopher George was a drinker and a smoker, and he would die way too soon of a heart attack at only 52, but he left behind an enormous body of work. By the end of his career, he mostly made his money in Italian and B-movies where he could play the star. You might recall the speech Al Pacino gives Leonardo DiCaprio at the beginning of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood about being the villain in America or a star in Italy. Yeah, this is that. I am particularly fond of Christopher George's work with Italian horror weirdo Lucio Fulci during this period. So in the Dreyfus role, we have Richard Jekyll, another co-star of John Wayne's in classics like Sands of Iwo Jima, but his biggest role came with The Dirty Dozen and its sequel. In 1970, Jekyll would star with Christopher George and Andrew Prine in a movie called Chisholm with John Wayne, notable for the fact that all three stars would join forces for Grizzly only six years later. Richard Jekyll's later work was mostly in television, and by all accounts, he had a very happy life with his wife and his kids, who, by the way, won a PGA Tour Open at one point, and Richard Jekyll passed away at the age of 70 from cancer. All things being equal, pretty good life. Our third lead, the fill-in for Robert Shaw's Quint character in Jaws, was Andrew Prine. Another great character actor coming out of the 60s and 70s, Prine has been performing for almost 50 years. He's dedicated his life to stage and screen, working with the Actors Studio for decades. He's still with us as of this recording, hopefully listening to this very podcast so we can hear this. Andrew Prine should have been a bigger star. He has presence and swagger, and I love him. With our leads in place, Grizzly was shot in Camden, Georgia, about the same spot that Deliverance was shot in. The plan was to use a mechanical bear for close-ups, but, and I swear this is true, someone left it outside in the rain, and all the mechanical parts rusted and corroded to the point that the mechanical bear could not be used for the film. So much of the action with actors and the, quote, bear, happens with a guy wearing a bear arm glove. There is a real bear in the movie, an 11-foot grizzly named Teddy, but he was, quote, trained but not tamed and couldn't be trusted not to go grisly on the actors when they started flailing and screaming with him in the frame. When Grizzly was released in 1976 with the amazing tagline, 18 feet of gut-crunching, man-eating terror, it was a giant hit. In short order, it racked up $30 million in revenue and then $40 million globally, making it the most successful independent film of that year. Unfortunately, the producer thought all of that money was his, which led to yet another lawsuit, this time for Girdler and the writers on the film to get paid. Even before Grizzly was released though, Girdler and his scrappy team of independent filmmakers were working on another animal-based horror movie, Day of the Animals. Working again with Richard Jekyll and Christopher George, Day of the Animals fell neatly into the eco-horror trend of the late 70s. In this case, humanity's depletion of the ozone layer makes all of the animals go screwy while our heroes are trekking through the California mountains. This leads to a scene in which a shirtless Leslie Nielsen fights a bear, Teddy again, for the love of a woman with a big stick. I swear that is also true. When Day of the Animals wrapped, Bill and his team were in full-blown legal war with the producer of Grizzly over money from that film, and Day of the Animals failed to reap the kind of box office that Grizzly did. With troubles mounting, Bill happened on a paperback in an airport during a layover while location scouting. The book was a bestseller of horror novel called The Manitou, a book all about possession with a uniquely Native American lore at its root. Bill loved the book, and he managed to nab the rights from author Graham Masterson for $50,000 the next day. 
With the rights in hand, Bill started pitching the movie adaptation of The Manitou all over Hollywood. The biggest interest came from Avco Embassy Pictures, who were a go so long as they could see a script first. Bill said, I just happen to have a script. Wait right here. He scooted out of that office and sat down with some friends of his, and three days later, you got yourself a script for the Manitou. Bill took that three-day script over to Avco Embassy Pictures, and they loved it. They gave Bill Girdler more money than he'd ever had before, about $3 million worth. That kind of money gets you a Tony Curtis in your lead role, the famous father of Jamie Lee Curtis, of course, and you get all kinds of special effects, some of them even good. And while there are fun things about The Manitou as a film, it's also the story of a woman who gets a tumor on her neck that grows into a Native American medicine man demon thing, represented by a little person who emerges from the tumor in monster makeup. And then there's also a laser fight in space. Girdler was nothing if not bold in his filmmaking. Unfortunately, he was also running out of time. The Manitou was released to naturally awful reviews. It did a little business, but Grizzly remained the gold standard for commercial success. Still, Girdler was undaunted. He had more projects lined up, a movie with Andrew Prine called Kentucky Wild, and he managed to secure rights to another Graham Masterson horror novel, The Gin. But he was especially excited to start pre-production on a Star Wars ripoff entitled Overlords. But for Bill Girdler, time had run out. While in Manila scouting locations for Overlords, the student pilot at the stick in the helicopter with Bill Girdler inside it decided to try a little bit of a stunt and fly under some power lines. But he misjudged, and the helicopter hit the lines, and the helicopter exploded, killing William Girdler and the student pilot flying him. Neither body was ever recovered. He was 30 years old, a decade younger than his father when his father lost his life, and 20 years the junior of his deceased grandfather. Whatever curse hung over the Girdler name, Bill could not escape it. And yet, in six short years, he made nine movies. Some of them pretty good, most not, but only Sheba Baby ever felt cynical. Whatever else you can accuse William Girdler of, his dedication to movies was real. I don't know if he met or exceeded his talent, but we are talking about him right now. I wonder if he had that inkling when he was toiling away on the car lot, when his wife could no longer stick with him in his crazy dream of making movies, that one day he was going to be a filmmaker that would be remembered for decades. I hope so, and I'll be damned if he wasn't right. Take that early death, have a fistful of cinematic immortality. And with our hero laid to rest, let us now turn our attention to his most successful film, a movie that you might say is an awful lot like Jaws, but it has its own charms too. Chad, grab the sleeping bags, we're headed to the woods. Ladies and gentlemen, bears and cubs, it's 1976's gut-crunching, man-eating grizzly. <sighs> Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to a brand new season of Pick 6 Movies. This here is season 16, a season we like to call, it's like Jaws, mm -hmm. but it's not. And that sound of approval that you hear is none other than my dear friend and co-conspirator in this nonsense, Chad Cooper. Welcome to Grizzly Time, sir. <laughs> I can barely contain myself. I am so excited. As we were discussing right before we start recording, I have a long history with the movie Grizzly. I saw this a bunch when I was a kid. I continued to watch it as an adult. I think it's safe to see I've seen Grizzly at least 10 times over the course of my life. I've seen it twice <laughs> over the course of the last week. And I think one can safely say it's like Jaws. It is like Jaws, but with a bear. That's really the big distinction here. <laughs> Everything else is pretty fuzzy between the two, and I mix them up all the time, Chad. 
This movie hit the theaters in 1976. That is 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, bears were all over the place in popular media. You remember there was that NBC show, The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams? One of my favorites, yeah. Dan Dan Haggerty. Haggerty. Remember, he was a man wrongly accused of murder who goes off the grid and hides in the woods and raises a bear cub to be a full-size grizzly bear to be his only true companion and protector. Yeah, Ben was his name much like the rat if you think about the premise of that tv show if you were accused of murder and you ran off to hide in the woods and raised a bear to protect you from people that might be snooping around it does look a little suspicious right well if that's why you state that you're raising the bear if you know like old jesse had come around to trade furs and said why are you raising that bear and he said well it's to murder anyone who knows about the person i killed (laughs) oh shit jesse sorry about this ben get him there was another show gentle ben which was about a kid who was pals with a bear that was named ben which Uh starred a surprisingly once adorable child-sized version of clint howard well the problem with clint howard in terms of just pure aesthetics is that he looks exactly the same at this age as he did at the age of six I thought you were going to say at the age of two months. As we all do, Chad, I think he is getting closer to infancy as he goes. Why were both those bears named Ben? It's a fine question. I think there's a little bit of alliteration going on here with Ben the Bear kind of stuff, Mm. but eh, it's a thin excuse. You know, on the TV show BJ and the Bear, there wasn't a bear on that show at all. The character on that show, Bear, was a chimpanzee, and the truck driver, whose name was BJ, he never solicited a prostitute for oral sex. Not once. And I watched that show a lot. I kept waiting for him to say, hey, I want one of me. (laughs) You know, but not since my first viewing of Handy Manny have I encountered a show with such a misleading title. No BJs and no bears. It's amazing that it lasted three seasons or whatever. And no Manny Handies either. Now that we've said this, I wonder how long BJ and the Bear was actually on the air. That's a real nice litmus test for America. How long did we stomach that? When I was a kid one time, my parents used to force me to go play sports and I was watching a, or, and I watched a rerun of the Incredible Hulk and then I was supposed to get on my bike and go to baseball practice. But then I saw that the episode of BJ and the Bear where he did battle with vampires was coming up and I was like, eh, fuck baseball practice. I want to see BJ and the Bear fight vampires. And I did. You made the right choice. <laughs> I don't think there's any question about that. The movie Grizzly currently has 876 reviews on Amazon Prime with an average score of four and a half stars. And I read a lot of these reviews, Bo, Mm -hmm. and most of them, in fact, the majority of them started off like this. I watched this movie when I was a kid and it scared the shit out of me. And looking back as an adult, I enjoy how shitty this movie is, but... I still hold a dear place in my heart for the 90 minutes that I was a kid and I sat in a darkened theater with my father passed out drunk beside me. And for a brief moment, he wasn't screaming at me or hitting me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Grizzly the movie. Five stars. I think I might have written that. That sounds familiar. I saw a bunch of one-star ratings from people named Bo R. and B. Ransdell complaining about the less-than-stellar transfer to Blu-ray and how shitty it was. You know anything about those, Mr. Ransdell? (laughs) Well, yes. If they're about the Kino Blu-ray, then yeah, I do know a couple of things about those comments. (laughs) Actually, the Blu-ray transfer is pretty good. I do have a Blu-ray of Grizzly, in case you're wondering. I wasn't wondering. I knew that was happening. Day of the Animals Blu-ray also quite a good transfer if you want to see (laughs) the aforementioned leslie nielsen fight teddy the bear with a stick it looks amazing let's talk about grizzly the movie yes please it opens up in georgia where what appears to be a privately owned helicopter is flying fast and low above the treetops and here we get to be helicopter pilot don stober and he's wearing these sweet faded aviator (sighs) sunglasses and this wide collared denim jacket over the top of a beige corduroy button-down shirt and he says, look at here, man. This here land is about the same as it was from back when the Indians was wandering around it. And I'm immediately thinking, oh, we are going to have a Native American curse that is going to cause this killer bear to eat all the white folk. If only. That doesn't happen. No. Oh. But, well, and the thing that you learned real quick about Andrew Prine's Don Stober is that he is a friend of nature, Chad. Because he's <laughs> like, hey, man, listen, I know you didn't ask me or nothing, but... We ought to be preserving all this land. It's the one good thing we can leave to our kids, man. 
<laughs> and the music is so incredibly like upbeat until the helicopter starts to come to the edge of a mountain shad and then the title grizzly comes out from behind the mountain and the music goes dun dun and then as soon as the title fades the music gets happy again like no 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 don't worry about it yeah i know that title was scary and all but you're okay now it sounds like the kind of music you would hear in an episode of flipper or a swiss family robinson sequel you know you'd be a bunch of family friendly folk running around dressing up raccoons as their baby brother it's the background music to a ride queue at Disneyland, but it's one of the old school rides like the Hall of Presidents or something mm -hmm. where some poor schlub has <laughs> to tell a crowd 150 times a day. If you'll just walk to the left, you'll see that we are once again viewing the majesty of the woods. Over here on your right is a beautiful sunrise. That's right, the sunrise in this forest means bedtime for some creatures, but some creatures are just now waking up, and you can see all the gophers. Look at them playing together on the land. Jesus Christ, how long? It was Two o'clock's my break. All right, and then over on the left, you're going to see a lot of the original Cherokee trails. Uh, Cherokee Indians used to follow these trails all the way up the mountain, and uh, they used to, uh, oh God, when's two o'clock? I'd like for you to meet my two friends, Pedro and i know <laughs> helicopter pilot don stober he's got these two men in his helicopter that you think are going to be important but they're not and he's whipping around up in the air look at here man if the government can keep the natural beauty of this land pristine and reduce development then we might be able to keep this american landscape like this forever be a damn shame if some italian american actor had to dress up as a native american indian standing on the side of the road looking all sad with garbage and litter thrown everywhere as a tear run down his cheek don't nobody want to see that over on the left here you can see more of those raccoons and gophers um uh, hoping to get a job at disneyland sometime in the future man <laughs> and we dissolve for this tour of the woods by helicopter to strangers to the town one presumes where it's a bunch of folks at this like trading post at the base of the mountain and from here everybody goes hiking up into the and i quote from the sign chad national park i like the store down in the ugly decade that was the 70s it's called indian springs trading post with those two flipped over canoes up on the roof and there's a sign with a an obligatory caricature of a native american up there promoting all the bullshit crap this junk shop has to sell you with shockingly almost illegally high profit margins you can get yourself a cap gun for 27 dollars uh, excuse me sir this uh sunblock says it's 22 dollars is that correct that's right the next store is 53 miles that way you want to pay <laughs> for the sunblock or you want to get out of my store <laughs> i'll just pay for the sunblock sir yeah yeah that's what i thought enjoy the camping we see a green station wagon it pulls up alongside these other cars that are on their way into national park and there are all these campers there and eventually the station wagon arrives up at the main ranger station and out pops ranger gale a female forest ranger who heads over to some other forest rangers where the movie introduces us to this film's version of brody from the jaws films except he's not brody chad you can mix that up i know i i mix these movies up a lot his name is not brody it's kelly he's ranger kelly yes ranger brody kelly no just eh, fine we'll call him ranger kelly sure so we don't get him mixed up also ranger kelly is a man yes ranger gale is a woman and ranger kelly is a man played by christopher george who again if you saw any movie in the 70s you probably saw christopher george in in one of them he looks like lee majors he's got that thick jaw and those sideburns and that big head of hair you know he's this small screen version of charlton heston as he's addressing the troops he's like look everyone i know that all of us have looked around and realized that there are way more campers than us we don't have a enough people to deal with all of this we're not gonna get enough people to deal with all of this so i don't know best of luck i guess anyway you all know your assignments no we 
you don't? Well, uh, I'm sure your assignments are very important, and you you should all really explore the boundaries of uh, your your positions here at the uh, national park. It's my first day here, sir. Gail, how about you take a uh, new guy for orientation there and... Uh, Which one's Gail? I gotta be honest, I don't know. Oh, the pretty one. Hey, Gail. Uh, yeah, orientation with Gail. About this time, this other very young ranger named Tom walks over to Ranger Kelly, who is still a man, and he says, uh, Hey, Ranger Kelly, I'd like to go on patrol with sexy Ranger Gail over here because I want to have outdoor sex with her because that's why most men become forest." strangers to have sex with a sexy forest ranger who's a lady like her we want to do weird shit out in the woods where nobody but god can see you and ranger kelly says look i don't think so tom i've got other plans for ranger gale that might involve a slightly older yet still functional penis that's currently hibernating in my trousers that's a bear joke ranger tom you can use that one when you get older you know run along and go catch yourself a snipe take that new employee over there with you snipes aren't real he needs some orientation now i can't really put my finger on what orientation is but he needs it yeah cheapers so we cut to inside this restaurant that's located at the forest lodge where we are introduced to the local owner walter an older white-haired man in a terribly fashioned checkered sports coat he's got a colorful ascot and he's smoking a pipe and he gives orders to the wait staff setting up the tables in the restaurant where we learn that we are at the end of the official season and bo do we ever see walter again after this scene in the movie uh no we do not i kind of thought walter was going to be the asshole mayor from jaws right but i think he's just a drunk who owns a barely revenue positive restaurant out in the woods it actually sounds like he's doing really well like so his daughter is allison and she shows up to give her father a successful businessman a bunch of shit about some unpaid bills and he's like oh don't worry we are having a good year and she's like you're not charging enough for wine and he's like, well, look, I, I charge enough for wine. Trust me. Like, we're making money on the wine. It's a good deal and people come back for the deal. Dad, look at these table tents. It says, buy one glass, get five free. This is not a way you run a business. And I gotta be honest, it's socially and morally irresponsible to encourage that type of alcohol consumption. Well, we've had a one glass for five glass policy here for, since we opened the doors in 1946, and we're not about to stop now. You let me, your father, handle all of this difficult math and business flibberty jibberty. Shouldn't you be off putting on your face or getting more beauty sleep or out shopping for something pretty? And if you go out shopping, buy more wine. This restaurant keeps running out. Dad, are you serious? You buy your wine retail? That's not how it works. You buy from a wholesaler, then you sell it at markup. Jesus Christ, how you ran this place for like eight years. It's like a child setting up a lemonade stand on the side of the road for alcohol. And just for listeners edification here, none of this matters. This whole thing with the lodge and the wine and her father doesn't matter a bit. Mm -mm. One thing that matters is that Walter says, you know, daughter Allison, let's change the subject how about we talk about you being a nature photographer in this movie and that's what defines your poorly constructed character <laughs> and we see her taking pictures <laughs> one time and then she like father like daughter just disappears from the movie at a certain point so yeah she does just disappear yeah but kelly does come in mm -hmm. and he says you know allison you should write a book called a woman's guide to <laughs> avoiding responsibility or how about a book called how to forget a meeting with handsome ranger kelly colon the life and times of allison the forgetful woman nature photographer that would be a great one too and then they're going Going off to photograph nature, he's got to be a guide or whatever. But as they're walking out, you know, this little bickering back and forth that I suppose is supposed to be, you know, <laughs> playful banter continues. And he says, you know what your problem is? You're spoiled. And she's like, what? Spoiled? That's a heavy word now. You better just not be throwing around the H word like that. Look, Allison, if that is your real name, I'm a real important person here in the woods. I drive around and I look for forest fires and I sometimes pick up trash when I see it on the ground and I help out campers who get poison ivy on their neither regions after performing the devil's business under the watchful eyes of squirrels and 
birds and the Lord Almighty. And the problem with you is you're spoiled. You know, Allison's a weird name. It's got the name Al at the beginning of it and the word son at the end, and apparently I'm in the middle of it. You know, you should change your name to Chris or Alex or Francis. Those are names that are clearly attached to a nice set of cans like yours. Are you going to take me up to the mountain or what? You kind of seem like a demwet, you know? I don't mean to throw stones, but you seem kind of stupid. I get to that a lot. Oh, look, a bird. Quick, let's have sex. He likes to watch. Chad, let's get to the real business of this movie. Mm -hmm. As we cut to a couple of lady hikers getting back to their camp after a long hike, one of them's like, yeah. oh boy, it's we've been walking for miles. There's no men with them. Just a couple of rugged, outdoorsy type gals wearing plaid shirts, talking about Melissa Etheridge and how their softball league's going and which farmer's market they like to go to back in town. Whether or not they're going to get that new Subaru Outback that they've been eyeing. <laughs> These two gals <laughs> yeah. who haven't found the right man yet. Margaret and Julie, that's their name. Yeah. They're tromping through the woods and they come up to their campsite where they've washed all of their clothes and hung them out to dry. Apparently you do that when you're camping. And so these two women, they sit down and they hear a snap and a crack in the woods and they turn around and Bo, who is it? It's dumb old Tom coming through the woods on his horse. And they're like, oh, a man. Hey, you two ladies, be careful out here and don't take any unnecessary risks. And when you leave, check in at the ranger station. Bye. Yeah, yeah, beat it. And so Tom takes off. Leaving these WNBA super fans to discuss the comedy stylings of Lily Tomlin. <laughs> and Margaret Cho. And then we get a little <laughs> bit of bear vision, which I like, which is the cheap way of just making the bear look like he's sneaking up on this campsite. And there's a lot of grunting. He's like, ah. <laughs> Kermit! <laughs> waka waka! <laughs> yeah. Kermit, I just want to eat a couple of campers. Is that so wrong? <laughs> Julie says, um, I gotta go pee. So her friend, Margaret, says, whenever it's time to clean up, you always have to go somewhere. And then Julie says, don't start with me, Margaret. We're having a nice time. And this is the kind of passive aggressive bullshit you always pull that reminds me of my mother. Oh, here we go again. It's been less than 24 hours and Julie has compared me to her mother. How am I supposed to feel when you say that to me? You know what? Oh, oh, there she goes. Look at it. Surprise, surprise. Julie walks away like she always does. Meanwhile, Grizzly is like, ah, uh, excuse me. Listen, I noticed your friend just walked away. I, I was wondering if maybe I could just maybe eat you and in very unjaws like music chad you don't make that mistake even though the music sounds <laughs> it, it might put you in mind of jaws but it ain't the same music we get a real deep woods mauling yeah no, grizzly know? just pops up and is like hey carbat and then just swipe swipe her the right to bear arms and ammunition more like the right to bear arms and amputation waka waka i'm a killer bear grizzly knocks her arm clean off what do you call a bear with no teeth a gummy bear <laughs> i said gummy bear waka waka after this glorious moment where this arm gets knocked off uh -huh. this other girl strolls up margaret and then sees the bear and takes all fucking running mm -hmm. all the way to an abandoned shack in the middle of nowhere yeah and so she gets inside and backs against the door you know he'll never find me in here and meanwhile grizzly is right outside giving one of these ah, why did mother nature make only one yogi bear because when he tried to make a second one he made a boo-boo waka waka she's like wait a second that is, i don't even know if that makes sense hey that bear's not half bad oh he's it's all bad. <laughs> <laughs> And so the girl with her back to this door is in prime position for a dude with a grizzly arm glove to uh -huh. punch through the wall and just Arr! and grab her. At which point she screams and fade out. I like that the music here really rips off John Williams' shark attack theme from Jaws. I mean, it's a lot like Ray Parker Jr.'s Ghostbuster finding inspiration in Huey Lewis's I Want a New Drug. To say that it is reminiscent of the John Williams theme is maybe underselling it a little bit. So we cut back over to Allison and Ranger Kelly chit-chatting in the woods Kelly's sitting in this convertible Jeep in the most ill-conceived way possible. 
It's the car equivalent of sitting on top of a picnic table with your feet on the bench seat. But in this case, his ass is on top of the driver's seat headrest where, you know, and his feet are on the steering wheel and his arms are on the door. It's all very convoluted. I'm guessing that they did it because it made it easier to shoot them on camera rather than go through the windshield. I was like, why not just have him lay on the hood of the Jeep, do a little cloud busting, you know, daydreaming. I got a feeling that being lost in one's own thoughts is a requirement for really any forest ranger. He says a number of times in the movie, I just like to be out here looking at the animals. You know, I get it. It's fun. I don't know any forest rangers. And I know that we have a lot of people who listen to this podcast who are forest rangers. But I truly believe that the most ideal person to be a forest ranger is someone who enjoys murdering animals without other people keeping an eye on what they're doing. I actually do know a forest ranger, believe it or not. Do they murder animals? out in the woods no she is a very lovely person who believes strongly in conservation (laughs) it's a little disappointing Hmm. she chose the wrong profession though i've told her that a number of times (laughs) i'm sure as her parents yeah she loves it anyway as they're awkwardly sitting chit-chatting she's like you know they say every face tells a story and you're a dissembler well as usual i don't know what that means I would like you to explain that a little better. You hide everything behind that big jaw of yours. One day it's going to crack. Mm-hmm. And, and Kelly says, yes, indeed, I do have a handsome jaw. Thank you for noticing. Most women seem to get lost in the pools of blue that I call my eyes. Say, hey, there's a couple of squirrels up on a branch. How about you and I go over there and try to make an outdoor baby? And before he can get his nut, Chad... <laughs> Tom pulls up on him and he says, hey, I'm about to go up to the mountain and check on those girls who were strangely without male companionship. They said they were going to come down, but then they never did. I heard a lot of loud screaming. It sounded like some kids playing a prank in the water with a shark fin attached to their back with a snorkel, but that wouldn't make any sense. A couple of girls, you say, meaning two girls, Hmm. one for you and one for me. Hmm. This situation might be just the kind of thing that Allison might enjoy taking photographs with. Allison, come along with us. Get your camera ready. I'm sure photos of Tom and I with these two lovely woodland hikers will tell quite a few stories for your camera to tell. On the way up, you can tell me all about your experience with erotic photography. Look, I've never taken any... You know what? You're an idiot. All right, we'll go. They head up to investigate. Uh You know, and I don't know why this photographer is needed for this investigation to get these girls off the mountain before dark. I don't know why this photographer is needed in this movie, Bo. She doesn't do anything. She really does not. And they end up going to the rough area, but they find nothing until they're checking out the shack, Chad. And in one of my many favorite moments in this movie Ranger Kelly goes to the door and tries it and he's like locked up tight as a drum no (laughs) one's getting through this door perhaps I should go round back to see if there's another door you know most shacks when you build them you usually put in two entrances one in the front and as has been my experience one in the back let's go see shall we what if I step six feet to my left Perhaps then I'll be able to get the bird's eye view on this cabin. Hold on a moment. There's a giant bear-shaped hole in the size of this shack. Waka waka. That might be able to provide us a little bit more visual evidence as to whether or not something nefarious happened here. Let me look inside. So he goes in and is kind of poking around the place, give it a real like, Jesus Christ, what happened in here? Slide whistle. Flower that squirts water. This all seems very curious. Cabinet with a black cat poised to strike. Why, this has all the makings of... And then a bloody body of this girl falls uh, right in front of him. He's like, oh, jump scare. But my guess is that the bear tucked this body up into the rafter of this shack as maybe a snack for later. Is that what we are to assume? Like two campers and one meal? That's too much hippie for any bear to consume during one sitting. I feel like there's a little self-hatred here, too. Oh, boy. Look, I just killed two campers instead of just the one like I've met. I'm just going to hide this out of sight, out of mind, Grizzly. That's how we're going to play this, Kermit. Hey, you know, Grizzly, it's okay. Okay, you're doing your best. I just got so hungry, and she was screaming, Kermit. 
I understand. She was screaming so loud, you just had to make her go a little bit quiet. We all have those kind of days. I've had a couple of times where I've come over to Piggy and just put my fingers around her neck and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed until, you know, she went to sleep. She'll wake up eventually. But that's the magic of any good relationship, Bear. It turns out, once she woke up, she kind of liked it. (laughs) Now I choke her all the time. So, it's suddenly nighttime. And Uh there's a search party out looking for Meredith, the lady friend of our dead Julie. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of backup rangers show up and they go over to Ranger Kelly and they're like, hey, what's going on? Because clearly they should know what it is they're doing out there at night. And Ranger Kelly says, look, man, I'm I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't have sex with the lost campers this time. It turns out, you're not going to believe it, a bear ate them. What we're doing is looking for any random pieces of these women that may have been tossed about or quite possibly regurgitated by this bear. They were wearing patchouli, which makes any creature vomit when consumed through the nose or the mouth. I can vouch for that. It turns out, based on my research, that Ani DeFranco drives bears into a frenzy. (laughs) That's all these ladies were playing. I can't quite put my finger on it. Ani DeFranco and Joan Armitrade. It was (laughs) all they played. It drove that bear nuts. Some random park ranger says, Jesus, Ranger Kelly, that's all we need. A killer bear on the loose in the woods? And, Bo, that's just a bear in the woods, right? Like, bears kill things and eat them. That's what they do? Mm -hmm. Maybe unless this guy's vision of a bear is more of a, Mmm, honey, where's my honey? What a blustery day. Piglet, get my red balloon. Let's have an adventure. My understanding was that most bears came in rug form. I wasn't quite prepared for the fact that before the rug, they were animals that walked around and ate and pooped. Did anyone else here know that? That bear rugs did not come that way, the way God intended? Soft and furry? Suitable for having sex with barely legal young ladies who are high on Sinsamia gold? We all knew that, sir. I like the cut of his jib. Find out if he has any Sinsamia gold in bear rugs. You know, there are a couple of squirrels up in the tree that I saw earlier. They haven't been satisfied, and <laughs> neither have I. Is he gonna fuck a squirrel? The answer to that is yes. Meanwhile, Allison is poking around taking in pictures and at one point kelly just kind of whips on her he's like you there the lady that takes the pictures that i was talking to in the jeep don't go too far from the fire there's i hear word a bear has come and is doing a number on the cabins in this area as well as a number of girls i've been led to understand yeah you're not the boss of me okay i'm gonna go do whatever i'm gonna walk over here and it's the middle of the night and there's no moonlight i'm sure you're gonna be totally safe all right i'm going to try to figure out what this whole killer rug situation is so allison and wanders off somewhat nearby and she's taking all these pictures and she stumbles and falls down where her arm goes like wrist deep into this buried pool of sludge and as she scoops it out it turns out to be blood and the body of the other dead female hiker So our bear hides his kills up in the rafter of shacks, as well as in shallow graves in the woods. Oh boy, I'll just bury her right here, Kermit. No one will ever think to lurk. Mmm, how about a little banana cream pie, huh? (laughs) Waka waka. And so we cut to one of like the top three or four most Spielberg shots of the movie, where it's Ranger Kelly hanging out with the coroner, Uh who is played by Charles Kissinger, the guy that was in Bill Girdler's movies from the beginning. And it's one of those where you see Ranger Kelly in, in focus in the background and there's a soft foreground focus. It's a really Spielberg shot. And they're looking over the pieces of the body again in a very Jaws moment of just like, here are some pieces of the victim that we found. Uh-huh. And then they do a little walk and talk in the hallway. And the doctor is like, look, I'll tell you what happened happen here this bear probably was looking for its cub these girls got too close to it bada bing bada boom it heard a little joan arbitrating bears lose their mind around joan arbitrating and then he the bear went nuts and killed these girls to protect the cub may maybe the bear thought that the two campers were trees and scratched his back up and down on them like he was in the jungle book and he got a little rough and he killed them that way Oh, oh, wait, maybe, maybe the bear was asleep. These two women, they got into a fight and then one of them got so angry, she went over and committed suicide by raking her face and body across the bear's sharp claws until she died. Then the other one saw what happened and decided to kill herself in the same way. 
and then before dying, tucked her own body up into the rafter of a shack. And then the other one buried herself in a shallow grave. That could have happened. Doctor, you're making a lot of great points. Olsen over there currently thinks the whole thing was a murder-suicide with the bear as uh, as the master planner. As much as I want to believe your science-based medical chatter, I can't. I should really call the head of the National Park Investigative Services to handle a case like this. I'm way in over my head here. Normally, I empty the trash cans and confiscate dope from hikers for my own personal at-home use. I have no authority to be running an investigation like this, and quite honestly, Doctor, the reason I'm the head ranger is one day I found the keys on the ground buried in a small pile of dirt. I don't really even work here. I pick them up and wham bam thank you ma'am. Everybody's calling me Ranger Kelly. That's not even my real name. I was born Armin Tamzarian for God's sakes. Whew. It feels good just to talk to someone about my problems. I gotta tell you, Doc, I, I really feel like this is some kind of Santa Claus scenario where just oh, having these keys makes me the ranger. I'm worried I'm gonna fall off the roof, crack my neck, and somebody else will be Ranger Kelly. Let's try an experiment. Here, you hold the keys. Jesus Christ, you're the head ranger now. Give them back to me. Look, I got an email. I don't know what any of these words mean, but apparently we took a lot of the bears to higher country last year. Now, does that sound like a thing to you, doctor? You are a doctor, right? Or are you a veterinarian? Are you a magician? Wait, where are my keys? <laughs> oh, you're good. Give those back to me. And the doctor is like, no, no, no. I'm not sure if it's one of those bears. Like, this bear, it, it ate the shit out of these two girls. You're sure this was death by bear. Is that what it says on your form? Death by bear. It says animal attack, but bears in parentheses. Mm, okay. It looks official to me. I do have the keys. So Ranger Kelly says, look, doctor, I just have to disagree with you on one small point. Bears don't eat people, mostly because they lie flat in front of fires and rarely move. And the doctor says, well, this one did. And then Kittredge, who is our mayor, our, our mean mayor in this movie. He's the National Park Supervisor slash Mayor of Amity. He shows up and he says, why the hell wasn't I notified that two very big fans of Katie Lang were eaten by a bear in the woods? What are you doing about this situation, Ranger Kelly? I had to hear about this between a two for a foreigner. You think that's how I want to find out about this, Kelly? Oh, you're talking to me? I thought you were talking to the Dr. Veterinarian Coroner over here. Doctor, hold these keys. Now you're in charge. You and him. I'm not taking those keys. Look, I work at the Kalini counter in the mall. Oh, that explains your soft, supple hands. Well, I'm out of here. And then <laughs> Ranger Kelly just lights a smoke in the lobby of this hospital and or police station or whatever, which I appreciate. I love the 70s <laughs> where just any public federal building was just like, ah, yes, that sweet Carolina smoke. Park Supervisor Kittredge says, enough of this. What are you doing about these killer bears in the woods? And Ranger Kelly says, yeah, we're looking for the bear. And when we find it, we're going to kill it can we do that can we kill the bear oh we don't even have to have a reason to do that <laughs> park supervisor kittredge says you keep me informed and i'll keep the public informed if anybody else gets eaten by a bear i might lose my job and there are only two possibilities either you moved all the bears to the high country and one came back or you didn't do your job in the first place kelly i put a pin in that for one second the man you need to talk to is a gentleman by the name of arthur scott now based on an email that i got the gist of i believe he is the one who relocated all of the bears up into and i quote from the email that was read to me the high country now that has to be bear water right in fact right now i'm in the slightly high country and this bear expert he's going to be a new character in our movie pretty soon he's dressed just like richard dreyfus in that movie jaws did you see that movie what a picture you know the shark didn't work during production but you wouldn't know it from seeing the film the director of that film steven spielberg he has quite a career ahead of him if you ask me have you seen my keys oh no i don't know who i am anymore Whose car do I take? <laughs> ah, let's see what's in the glove box. A different wallet. Well, it turns out my name is now Darren Faulkner. All right, well, let's see what this life is. Park Supervisor Kittredge says, Kelly, you get bear expert Arthur Scott here ASAP. And I hope I'm not talking to myself. I talk to myself all the time, especially when I'm having my morning BM. I call it my morning poop talk. Little secret, I drink a, some Chasen Sanborn coffee while I read the morning edition of the paper as I sit completely nude while on the toilet. A few words of self-encouragement at the right moment, and I void my bowels like a champ. I know this is off topic here, Kittredge. 
cartridge, but can I tell you that I haven't closed the bathroom door since 1968? Not once, not one time. Showering, pooping, peeing, doesn't matter. I run the gamut, and the world is my oyster. I'll tell you why, and I'm not ashamed of it. I like it when people watch, whether it's squirrels, birds, God Almighty, or even you, Kittredge. And so, because of this killer bear news story... Uh Uh-huh, the hippies get word of it. All of the hippies flee the (laughs) woods in a wave of just flannel running down a hill. Uh, They're sprinting through the woods like they all saw this imaginary dragon that each one of them believes is only real when more than two of them look at it at the same time. They heard there's a, a sale on hot dogs at the Piggly Wiggly, and boy, it brought people running. We get a voiceover announcer here who says, we have a special announcement. Two women were eaten by a large bear telling hacky Catskill jokes and wearing a floppy brown hat. Ranger Kelly, the man in charge of operations after finding the keys for the main office in a pile of dirt, has ordered all backpackers in the high country to make their way down to the only slightly baked country, where we will be handing out leftover cold pizza for nourishment. Hurry, hippies, if you want to get some of this delicious food. Back at the ranger station. Uh Uh-huh. Ranger Kelly is on the phone with someone who we don't know and never see, who is a middle person in between him and Scotty, the guy that they're trying to get in touch with, their their bear expert. And he's giving it a real being a dick to the waitress at the restaurant on this. You get me the guy who dresses like Richard Dreypus from that hit movie Jaws or else you're going to have to deal with the Ranger Kelly shit show and it's coming to your town pretty soon. One of my favorite things about this is that as he's demanding to talk to Scotty, I've got two people down here who have been eaten by a bear and if you don't get Scott on the phone, you're going to be looking for another job. I need your help finding bear expert Arthur Scott. Check the phone book, woman. Look under B for bear or X for expert. Do I have to do everything? All right, I love you too. And Allison, the gal pal, is in the office watching all of this unfold, which is probably why she ducks out of the movie, because she's like, I just don't want to live with this my whole life. This kind of rage simmering under the surface that explodes every now and again, like Vesuvius. The film cuts over to the woods where bear expert Arthur Scott, he leaps from the brush wearing denim everything, and he's got a deerskin pelt wrapped around him. And it turns out that bear expert Arthur Scott is tracking a deer. And he's also got a portable radio that allows him to take phone calls out in the middle of nowhere on the side of a mountain. I guess that's a thing. Yeah, it's a satellite phone he calls in. And when it rings, he's just like, damn it, I've been watching these deer for a long time. Who in the hell is this? I give explicit orders not to be disturbed during my surveillance. I'm a scientist, for God's sake. Uh, Scotty, it's your old pal Ranger Kelly. I don't know if you remember me. I'm the ranger. I found the keys on the ground, in the small pile of dirt. They put me in charge. I know you found the keys. Look, Scotty, uh, we're in a bit of a pickle here. Uh, A bear killed what appeared to be a couple of LGPA golfers. They were on a camping trip without their husbands here to protect them. You know how women do. Anyway, Park Supervisor Kittredge, he's holding me and, well, uh, let's be honest, more likely you responsible, more you than me. I have no training in these types of matters, so could you get back here toot sweet? And on your way back, could you pick up some Chase and Sanborn coffee Grounds. I miss my morning funny papers and daily deposit today. Be a dear. Thank you. Ta-ta. Kelly, this is total bullshit. I have been up here living with this family of deer, Herb and Tanya, and their kid deers, Dalton and Sarah. Did they watch you masturbate? Frequently. I'm living with them. I'm living as one of them. And now, Kelly, you're asking me to abandon all of that, Kelly. Just to come down and talk to you about some bears. Did they enjoy watching? It's hard to tell. They're deer, Kelly. They don't have rich internal lives. They're not like us. Do you think they would enjoy watching me masturbate out in the woods? I could be there in 15 minutes. There's really no way to be sure, Kelly. So, Scotty heads down the mountain to talk to him. And as he hangs up, Allison asks the question that we're all asking, which is, who was that? That That was bear expert Arthur Scott. He's a naturalist. He doesn't shave his legs when he goes swimming, and he always makes a point to eat decorative garnish on any plate given to him. Orange wedge, kale, parsley, he eats them all. And he knows every bear in the forest. Yogi, Bryant, Chicago, if it's a bear, he's an expert. Also, he's a pervert and masturbates in front of deer while they watch. And then we get, Chad, the backstory we did not need on Ranger Kelly. Boy, this uh, this old ranger scam sure isn't working out like a 
thought. When I found these keys in that pile of dirt, I was really hoping it was all going to be showing slideshows to these kids, looking at those squirrels, making sure the squirrels were looking at me, just having a good time, you know? And it turns out there's this whole bear thing, this Scotty gentleman, and I gave up a promising career of being a boy toy for a rich lady for all of this. And she's like, what? What happened again? I was married to a rich woman, filthy witch, but it turns out we were both mercenaries. Then it got to be too much, so you know what I did? I pretended that I was having an affair to end the marriage, but that didn't work. It never works. And then I left. Bingo, bango, keys in the dirt. Here I am, head ranger in the woods. Honestly, I don't even know what state we're in. And Alice is like, wait a second, you're lying. Oh, you think so? Am I? And her response to this is, I don't care. I don't understand this relationship at all. This is just a good old-fashioned forest fuck. Why do they not dispense with all of this and just fuck? She's not around long enough to have sex. Also, Allison is a very interesting-looking woman because at certain moments in this film, she looks like she's 17, and other times she looks like she's a 70-year-old lady. She has that very sharp jawline that'll trick you. It's like that weird illusion. What do you see here? A young woman or an old witch? And it's like, I see both. Like Catherine Hepburn at 30 could have been 16 or 87. Yeah. It's like Betty White. Yeah. She's another one. Like, is she 22 or is she 102? She's both. And I got to say, a witch. every name we're mentioning, National Treasures, everyone. So out in the woods, Chad, back out into grizzly country. Yes. Some hunters are out searching for grizzly. I thought it was a bunch of park ranger that were uh, romping around. Yeah, I guess you're right. They don't necessarily look completely official in my mind. And then Tom Olson and Gail, the two that wanted to run off and screw at the beginning of the movie, uh, they're out hunting for this bear together. And they just kind of agree like, boy, we're never going to find this bear. How about you take off all your clothes instead? There's a waterfall over there. Maybe you should go over and get a little bit more comfortable so she does she takes off to uh, peel off some clothes and tom is doing like a quick survey of the area or something to make sure there's no grizzlies around i'm gonna go make sure there's no bears or my mom looking meanwhile grizzly is like what is this another park creature ah oh, this is gonna be delicious waka waka and she takes off her clothes or strips down to kind of panties and bra well that's what a woman does when there's a lagoon and a waterfall nearby bo it's just natural and a killer bear she winds up to this waterfall uh-huh. and that's where grizzly strikes ah what do you call a wet bear a drizzly bear waka waka that joke was all wet hey what do you think of the movie so far i know <laughs> i've seen detergents leave a better film so the bear kills ranger gale who is still a woman or was uh, a woman yeah. and blood just pours into the rushing waters of the lagoon uh, i mean kinda it's a pretty thin amount of blood in the grand scheme of things she was a tiny lady it was a tiny lady but also it's kind of a shitty effect but my my love for grizzly knows no bounds let's come back to the lodge where ranger kelly is sitting in the restaurant doing what he does best smoking and drinking and allison comes over to console him and she's like so uh are you okay ranger kelly and kelly says ah, poor tom he's really gonna miss that gale you know she was the only ranger on staff that even entertained the idea of consensual sex he asked all the other fellows but none of them were interested you know i gotta tell you albertson there's gotta be something that i'm not doing to keep people from getting eaten by bears honestly i've sat here all day and what else could i be doing he complains about the ice here here i am just chewing ice cubes while out there there's some giant killer rug that's uh, attacking uh, park rangers uh, you know kelly you could get off your ass and go kill the bear i can't help but think maybe there's something i could do some some hidden thing that i'm just not considering yeah there are guns in your office and ammunition i don't touch those no i i feel like there's some other thing i could be doing some maybe i could go give a lecture a Around a campfire, drive around the woods and look at animals, climb a tree, smoke a joint the size of your thumb, sleep for a couple of days, piss my pants, wake up, surprise that I'm still alive. Beyond that, I don't know what I could be doing. Look, I gotta be honest with you, I'm not meant to be a park ranger. I don't even know if that's my job title, park ranger. 
That's what they call me. Look, all I want is for Scotty to hurry up and get here. It seems like somebody ought to be in charge, and I think both of us can agree it can't be me. Especially in this state. I've been drinking since noon, but I've really been at it for the last two hours. Kicked it up and Have you seen Scotty? He looks a lot like Richard Dreyfuss. From that movie Jaws. Have you seen it? Smashing good picture. Kelly, at least hung over the next day, goes up in the helicopter with Don Stover. Uh-huh. And now we got a movie. This is all I want out of this movie is these two knuckleheads looking for a bear. Ranger Kelly is looking for the bear with this pair of binoculars. And Don Stover says, oh, hey there, son. Flip them binoculars around because you's making the earth look far away. If you look through them tiny holes, it makes it the ground look real close to you. Oh, well, look at that. It just jumps right up at you, doesn't it? It does. Hey, let me ask you another question, son. Have you looked for patterns in the bear's behavior? Because bears have patterns. Well, the only pattern that I've been able to figure out and quite frankly i'm no expert on anything really but i did notice that he seems to be into the ladies oh oh, yeah give me a little bit of knuckle bump i know what you're talking about this bear's a ladies man also he doesn't like to stick around he's a real hit it and quit it kind of bear in fact he's killed three of them so far one was a female ranger and the other two were indigo girls as sir mix a lot pointed out don some people like to hit it and quit it but i I, for one, like to stay and play. All of this talk of bears made me think of something. The fact that there's a bear down on the ground. Perhaps we should land the helicopter and I could go kill the bear. I did bring a gun and some ammunition. Well, that sounds like a pretty good idea, man. How about I set it down right here? They get out and just go chase it after this pile of coats. Say, man, kill that thing. It's moving. Just shoot it. Hey, man, I think we got all the hunters and park rangers and campers off the mountain, so it's fair game. Just like that movie with Cindy Crawford. You can kill anything out here. (laughs) They go to kill this bear, and it turns out it's bear expert Arthur Scott crawling around on all fours with a bear pelt on his back. That's normal. Immediately, Scotty is like, listen, you guys, I've been really tracking this bear, and one thing I can say for sure, this isn't our bear. It's a grizzly. It's a Usus Arctus Horbillus. It's a great white. I mean, a grizzly bear. Now, listen, son, that just can't be. It's science fiction. You know, fairy tales. There ain't no grizzlies up here, man. You know? (laughs) Then <laughs> Scotty says, not only is this a grizzly bear, it's 50 feet, and it's an ancestor from the Pleistocene era, and it's a pure carnivore. What we're dealing here is a perfect engine, an eating machine. It's really a miracle of evolution. And all this machine does is shit in the woods, eat campers, and make little grizzlies. That's all. And this bear is at least 15 feet tall, and it weighs over... <laughs> 2,000 pounds, and it only eats meat. Chad, I got to ask you about this. As many times as I've seen this movie, Uh there is this running, and I hesitate to call it a gag, Right. with Scotty always eating a sandwich. Uh Uh-huh. And I don't get it, but it's introduced here where Don's like, say, man, why are you always eating a sandwich? I'm hungry, okay? And it pops up a couple of other times, and I'm like, I don't know if this is supposed to be a joke. But anyway, meanwhile, Chad, in area R3, Mm -hmm. over by sector 7g we've got some campers singing at night it's a little campground area it's a lot of teenagers it's the opening of jaws where all the kids are around the fire yeah but there's a bunch of parents nearby yeah well that's the problem nobody's getting Uh, naked and going into the surf smoking dope and getting high and fuck in the woods oh man oh jaws what a great movie we cut over to this man and woman who are i guess part of the chaperones and they decide to leave the main campfire and go over to do some tent fucking Uh and the guy in this scene Uh is quite an unattractive man (laughs) you mean the red toque that he's wearing doesn't set off that porn stash of his even for the mid 70s (laughs) this guy is an ugly man i think he knows that because there's a line we'll get to in a minute this guy you're right this guy's a total mess And he looks awful grateful that he's making out with this pretty lady. He looks like Morty from Meatballs. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he does. (laughs) And I, for one, Chad, am ready for this summer. (laughs) Because what happens is the lady is like, let's go fuck in the tent. And he's like, all right, um, let me just finish this beer. And so she goes to the tent. (laughs) And she puts on a nightgown. Yeah. And spritz his perfume. Makes him a nice cheese and wine plate. And meanwhile. (laughs) Well, Morty, back at the fire, (laughs) is finishing off his pull tab Lowenbrow and giving himself a self-satisfied grin like, you sure did it this time, Morty. You got yourself a good one. (laughs) 
<laughs> and then Grizzly is like, wait just a second here. That pretty lady doesn't belong with a Morty like that. Her! Waka waka. And he just reaches down and snatches her up out of the tent and kills her. It's one of the more violent deaths of the movie where you see her really thrown around a bunch. He kind of spins her around in a wrestling move at one point, I thought. Oh my God, that bear just put old Texas Diddy Twister on her. She was <laughs> upside down and cracking her neck on the floor of that forest. <laughs> oh my God, where are the refs? They need to stop this. This larger group of campers and young teens and adults, they just go into a panic frenzy and start screaming and running around. The yeah. movie immediately cuts to a few minutes later when Ranger Kelly, thankfully, has showed up to dispense the panicked crowd with a uh, get back to your campsites and your tents shows over people fireworks going off behind him shows over a couple of things are one why were people camping at all knowing that there was a bear that ate three people within the last 24 hours and number two why are these people still hanging around after a member of their own group was just attacked and killed by a bear have you ever tried to put a tent back in the bag that it comes in you just leave it those tents are expensive what was the last time you were at rei L let me set the record straight right now uh -huh. all right i've been camping once all right <laughs> when i was eight years old and i was forced to go uh -huh. all right i pay a mortgage i will be goddamned if i'm gonna go sleep outside under a piece of plastic sometimes there's netting too jesus christ <laughs> so morty by the way this is my favorite not my favorite it's too hard to pick one of my favorite things in this movie is when ranger kelly is like say that's sure a tough break uh that pretty lady of yours being murdered and all by a bear say you're gonna finish that low and brow and morty <laughs> just is weeping like a child and says she loved me. And Rachel Kelly's like, yeah, I'm sure she did. I mean, somebody has to. Good Lord. You get a face that only a mother could love. I know this feels like piling on at this particular moment, but oof, that hat is not doing you favors, my friend. You clearly seem like you had an emotional connection to this mauled woman. You know, how about this? You can ride in the back of the ambulance with your dead lady's corpse. Do you think that might make you feel better? Would you like to turn on the siren? Fair warning. She did shit herself when the bear tossed her around, so the stench is a bit overwhelming you get used to it we all do it and as many animals as i've come across in the woods they immediately evacuate their bells as soon as they're rent apart by hawks and whatnot waka waka. wait a second did anyone hear a bear <laughs> park supervisor kitridge he shows up and he says kelly this is all your fault and that bear expert arthur scott you're a maniac running around in your animal costumes i like the fact that as kitridge is really reading him the riot act he's complaining uh. about scotty who is present but off camera <laughs> <laughs> not one of bill girdler's finest directorial moments where you can kind of hear him in the background like is he talking about me wait a second i should be on camera to defend myself i think i'm familiar with the fact you are going to ignore this particular bear problem until it walks right over and bites you in the ass wait did you catch that did the boom mic pick it up ah crap i'm not talking to anyone but you kelly i don't know who this is and i want oh that's andrew scott okay well I i've been asking for you who's this guy oh this this is morty apparently his mother was killed he was going to have sex with her while all these birds and squirrels watch he's a bit of a pervert then kittredge says i don't care what you do just get the job done or i will do you, would you like the keys this job is terrible i'm afraid you're gonna have to change your name but other than that it's quite a good gig so we cut to the next day yeah when the real solution to our problem a bunch of pickup trucks jeep wrangler and an el camino filled with hunters they all just run out into the woods brandishing weapons in their hands across land that has no hunting signs clearly posted we cut over to ranger kelly helicopter pilot don and bear expert arthur scott riding around in a topless ranger truck and they see all these militia-esque hunters wandering off on the side of a mountain road looking for a bear to kill and then one hunter stops to look at some claw marks on a tree and he gives it a real like oh those are big claw marks and then we get more bear cam pov footage and we got a waka waka oh boy safety orange is my favorite color to eat i'm back in the movie ah. i thought i saw a boar you mean a bear no a boar this movie's boring me to tears <laughs> 
This movie reminds me of Aspen. Because of all the mountains? No, because it's downhill from here. Oh! <laughs> so Grizzly starts tracking this guy, and then the hunter turns around and sees Grizzly because he Grizzly stands oh, up on its hind legs. But you can't see his face because look how tall I am. Waka waka. <laughs> It's too tall for the camera to see his face. And this guy is like, oh shit. And then just takes off running. And Grizzly is like, why are you running away? Come back here. So it's now a chase between Grizzly and this hunter dude. Waka waka, I'm right behind you. Hey, why don't bears eat fast food? Because it's hard for them to catch. Waka waka, slow down. That's not funny. And get away from me. <laughs> so this guy sees a tree cleverly positioned near the edge of this ravine. So he jumps onto the tree slides down on that thing ah. runs off yeah, yeah grizzly is like well that just seems like dirty pull <laughs> hey grizzly it's okay you're doing a great job thanks you're kermit why are there no songs about murdering bears that also happen to tell bad jokes? I've heard the screams too many times to ignore them. I know that you've heard them too. Someday we'll find it. The Grizzly Connection. Dead campers, jaws, ripoffs, and you were. <laughs> Ah, thanks kermit so the dude ends up just kind of falling ass over tea kettle into this river where he is carried away to safety while grizzly sits at the edge like oh boy talk about takeout so we cut to the office of park supervisor and mayor of Amity Kittredge's office, where he's meeting with Quint, Brody, and Hooper. I mean, Don, Kelly, and Scott. And Kittredge says, look, I had to call in a horde of drunken hunters to kill that bear. My hands were tied. Look, guys, a bear is a bear. And one of these freelancers is going to kill it. And bear expert Arthur Scott struggles to keep his comments to himself when he hears Kittredge say, a bear is a bear. It's that physical response response you see some people express when they see someone do the Vulcan hand salute without extending their thumb. <laughs> it definitely says something. I mean, I like it. But uh, then there's a great moment where Kelly's like, look, first of all, we only had a couple of drinks. It's unfair to complain about all the drunken hunters. More importantly, <laughs> Kittredge, I want to know why you're always on my ass. And I don't mean that in the fun experimental kind of way. I know what you mean, Kelly. I'll tell you why I'm on your ass. You're a maverick, and I don't have time for mavericks here in the forest. I don't really understand what you are getting at, mostly because I don't understand what the word maverick means. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to deal with the hunters as I see fit. Why? Because I don't understand any of the rules. Since the day I found that ring of keys out in the parking lot a couple of weeks ago, I've dedicated a good portion of each four-day work week to making this forest something special. I'm going to go out there and deal with this the way that I see fit, and you can just try to stop me, kid. And then our three principals leave somewhat anticlimactically. Well, Scotty has managed to fall asleep. Oh, he ate that big sandwich. Anyway, I don't understand any of that joke. So they go outside, and as they go out, they find Mrs. Kittner, I mean Olsen, in a car waiting for them. And they're like, hey, uh, what's going on with you, Tom? Sorry about the Gale thing again. Hey, guys, a bear almost ate a hunter. He's over at the clinic, and his clothes are all wet. He fell in the creek. It's the same creek where my old lady died. Boy, yeah, that probably stings a little bit but the good news is you know the way well so if you could take us right up that'd be great tom uh along the way if you want to put some flowers on the spot where your would-be girlfriend was bloodily mauled by a bear i'm a volunteer i don't have any money oh well that is a shame i was gonna ask you for 10 bucks well best of luck tom with all your future endeavors later that night the rangers head over to forest ranger hq to regroup <laughs> before they all go into the woods at night to hunt for a bear uh -huh. you know bo the safest time to hunt for a bear at night and allison shows up to remind everyone that she's in the movie mm -hmm. where she's like i'm coming with you and he's like i'm afraid you're not and then she doesn't we cut to the bear <laughs> walking through the woods at night where he comes upon two hunters asleep in their sleeping bags and the bear growls and the hunters wake up and they kind of sort of scream because it turns out that this bear isn't our grizzly bear i'm not in it yeah 
that. It's just a bear cub. Uh-huh. So the movie introduces the idea that bear cubs are the reason that the grizzly bear is killing humans. I'm like, hey, that's a twist. Right. Like it's messing with your babies. So now we have a motive for the bear killings. Although we've never seen the bear cubs at all in this movie. Oh, that's because none of this makes any sense. They decide rather than just release this bear cub out into the wild again. Hey, I got a plan. Have any of y'all ever seen that Jack Nicholson movie, The Pledge? Well, in it, he ties up a little girl, kind of, sort of, and lets it out there so a killer will come in and get the girl and he can kill the killer. What if we do that with this little bear cub? We'll tie it up and when the mama grizzly comes back, we'll kill it. I'm going to play Jack Nicholson. Wait till they get a load of me. You can't handle the truth. It's like looking at him in the mirror, isn't it, fellas? That's pretty good, all right. They stake this bear cub out in the middle of the woods Uh and hide in, like, hunter blinds. And as they're watching, this little bear cub is like, help, I'm lost. Shh, guys, we gotta be quiet. The grizzlies come. Go pedal your bullshit somewhere else. We're all full up here. I think I just quote. I never really finished that movie. And Grizzly shows up and is like, oh, a snack. Chomp, chomp, waka, waka. Eats this baby bear. What did the grizzly say after eating the baby cub? I'm stuffed. Waka, waka. That's not even a joke, man. That bear is scary and also doesn't understand joke construction. That last scene was something you can't unsee. I just kept my eyes closed to avoid seeing it in the first place. (laughs) Time is a little fluid in this movie, but almost immediately, it seems like Kelly gets there, right? Rancher Kelly, look, I gotta ask, which of you dum-dums decided to tie up a baby bear to lure a giant grizzly? Uh, me, sir? Bravo. Bravo. I never would have thought of it. As soon as I heard the idea, I thought... What a great idea. It didn't work this time, but here's my plan, gentlemen. We get a bunch of other little baby bears, and we stake them out in various spots, and then we all watch them. And Scotty is like, listen, this is actually a good thing, because now we know something that we didn't know before. This is a male. He's a boy. He's got a pee-pee. He's like, wait a second. How do you know that based on what? That he ate this little bear cub? Yes, exactly, because only male grizzlies are cannibalistic. Which is actually true. I looked that up. That's a true fact. So he's got to circle back around to this place where he ate the little bear before. And then the hunters are like, uh, I mean, we're already up here. We got a bunch of guns and shit. You want us to do anything? And Rachel Kelly looks blank eyed at them and then looks at Scotty, who kind of gives him the thumbs up like, yeah, yeah, that's okay. He's like, yes, have some. Yes, I think you should help us. <laughs> They have this crazy plan where the following morning, these hunters are going to go like high up on the mountain and then come running down the mountain, just screaming like a screaming like banshees. And when that happens, the bear will be driven ahead of them by the I'll noise. Oh, working no play makes Jack a no boy. Here I come, bear. Ooh. And then they're going to drive the bear out into the open or whatever, and then they'll kill it. This is a good plan. Olsen <laughs> shows up and he's like, look, I just want to be there when somebody kills this fucking bear it took the one woman that i ever loved from me look i gotta be honest i just think you're too much of a what did he call me? maverick you're too much of a maverick right now yes. olsen do you have any of that delicious chase and sanborn coffee i'm i think i've got a brick up inside me it's really got to come out do you have to have the funny papers mm. it's been a couple of rough days I've been drinking a lot of old granddad and smoking a lot of these Lucky Strike unfilters. Listen, Tom, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you go out into the middle of nowhere all alone. Do you know where Blind Man's Point is? Where we have that rickety observation tower, the one that's scheduled for demolition. Tom, could you do me a favor? Maybe head out there and you could climb atop it and look around. And if you see a bear, you could give us a signal like a whoop a woo or, or maybe you could take this torch and set the tower on fire. We'll see the smoke and then we'll come and rescue you and kill the bear i love all of these plans to be honest with you i'm not even sure where that is sir well it's easy you just go to black bear pass make a right down Crisley canyon up and over into kodiak lane and the, the watchtower is right there i think you'll <laughs> be quite pleased with the view that you're gonna see it's also right beside Ranger Gale Falls. Recently <laughs> named that because of, you know, your dead girlfriend. Oh, oh Gale. <laughs> so our trio of 
heroes camps down for the <laughs> night and scotty as they're getting ready for bed is like guys did you ever see that hit movie jaws <laughs> do you remember when that oceanographer had a bunch of tranquilizers but they never got to use it and it didn't add up to anything i got one of those too maybe we could do something just like that well not use it also say man them bullets you got there they nothing but bbs you're gonna need something of a little bit more power something suitable for the finale of a movie of this magnitude to really take down on a bear of that stature. Now, city boy, sit down and let me tell you a story because clearly you've been counting money your whole life. Oh, this is probably about a ship that sank in the ocean and a daring tale of struggle. Close enough. Simmer down, son. Look, a long time ago, there's this tribe of Indians known as the Indianapolis Indians. Here in these woods, these Indians, they got a case of the pox and a bunch of grizzlies came in and ate them all up. Some braves came back from hunting and they found the grizzlies eating them Indians. And then very expert Arthur Scott says, that is totally impossible to believe. Yeah, man, it is hard to believe. Unless, of course, he was one of them Indians. And I'm like, wait a minute. Don, the helicopter pilot, who's a white guy, uh-huh. is he telling us that when he was a boy, he was an Indian and saw bears eating his tribe? I think this is just some story he heard one time. Because there's <laughs> okay. that point as he's telling it where he's like, they had the pox, man. I mean, maybe it was a pox. I don't know. It was something like that. <laughs> pox, a palsy. They had something, man. Maybe it was just a, a good vacation spot, man. I don't remember exactly. It might have been scoliosis. I don't really know. What is gingivitis? I didn't go to medical school. Hell, I didn't go to pilot school. I will say this. The fact that they're trying to sub in this story of a herd of killer grizzlies for the indianapolis story in jaws (laughs) is real stupid but i give it to andrew prine who is totally trying to sell it like he is being a professional actor and doing his best. This scene escalates to the point to where he and bear expert Arthur Scott are having a yo mama so <laughs> insult contest. Yeah. <laughs> that, that all starts because Scotty says, look, I'm going to go out there alone because I can look like a bear and I can smell like a bear. And the helicopter pilot Don is like, look, man, everybody knows that you smell kind of weird, brother. But <laughs> hey, Ranger Kelly, can I have a dime, man? Now, you have to understand a phone call only costs a dime at the time this movie is made, but I need to borrow one because I need to go down this mountain and call his mother and ask her if she knows that her son is up here gallivanting in the woods like a damn animal or something. I think (laughs) if I talk to her with that dime that you're going to give me, Ranger Kelly, that I believe she would tell me that she is a little disappointed in her son. And this is what triggers Scotty where he's like, you know what, mister? If I called your mom, I bet she said she would be disappointed because you're her son. Yeah, man. If I called your mama, she'd probably be outside with a bowl because somebody told her it was chilly outside. First of all, I think all this talk of each other's mothers is getting sexy and we ought to explore it a little more. But I don't want you going in the woods alone. Scotty, I think it's a bad idea. And when I think something is a bad idea, it's generally a really terrible, terrible idea. We cut over to Blind Man's point where Ranger Tom is looking around and seeing nothing. And he's up on this watchtower. Oh boy. Just staring out at forest. And he sees about 20 drunken hunters come running down the hill a hooping and a hollering. And then we get some bear cam footage as it's lumbering through the woods towards the watchtower. And eventually the bear makes his way over, stands up next to the watchtower and with a real waka waka starts violating violently shaking the tower over and there are some actual shots of teddy the bear here where you see the bear in its entirety kind of for the first time as it's pushing against this rickety ass tower that they sent poor tom olsen up hey guys can you hear me on the cb radio the bear's here and he's shaking the tower violently it's not looking good for your buddy ranger tom are you talking about famed college football coach bear bryant he's there with you can you get an autograph ask him what the secret of leadership is i can't ask him anything thing he's just growling and snarling and trying to push over the tower get away shoo hardly seems they would have won a national championship with that kind of coaching wait a second you don't mean that giant rug exactly that's what i'm talking about olsen also gets a couple of shots off with the bear but that just pisses grizzly off oh kermit this guy is shooting at me i'm gonna eat him so much finally the bear bangs on this tower so much that he just exclaims ah what's a bear's favorite season it's fall waka waka and he pushes over the watchtower and it crashes down 
down on the ground. And the bear doesn't even eat Tom. It's enough that the bear killed him. I heard they only showed this movie in private screenings. Was that because they were embarrassed to show it in public? <laughs> also, you know how I love this. There is a great dummy in the, the tower collapsing shot that flips and flops all over the place. Yep. That does my heart good. Uh-huh. And then our trio of heroes arrive in time to find poor Tom Olson dead among the wreckage. Can't help but feel like he was trying to tell us something with that last transmission of his. And he's covered in blood. Yeah. Like an excessive amount of blood. I don't know that this much blood would come out of your body by falling 20 feet from the top of a watchtower. Yeah, cut to Geraldo Not Vera, who is this fuzzy-faced reporter who's interviewing a guy just near the lodge. I looked up to see if I could find out who the actor was he was being interviewed, because I would have bet $100 that it was the guy who wrote the book that this movie was based on. You mean Peter Pinchley? <laughs> that is 100% who I thought okay. this was going to be, and it was going to be Peter Pinchley. <laughs> yeah. and I was like, oh, that's what we're doing here. We're not only ripping off the plot, we're ripping off the cameos, too. A shadow in the form of a killer bear. <laughs> This Geraldo Not Vera dude is interviewing just a random dude about this bear. And the guy says, I'll tell you, I just feel real bad for the ranger. Said no one ever about a park ranger. <laughs> <laughs> there's kind of a reverse of the shot in jaws where you kind of push through the window as the orca heads out to sea but in this version it's pulling back from the window where you see the crowd outside and you pull back and you realize you're in the ranger office with kittredge and ranger kelly we should send some flowers yeah to the funeral of whatever his name was Ranger Kelly, my boy was out in those woods. It's that scene of Jaws where Kittredge is apologizing and anything I can do. And like you said, he offers to send flowers, which thanks, I guess. Look, I have no idea what's going on here. Something about a bear. Apparently, I have multiple funerals that I'm expected to attend. I might be speaking at one or two of them. And outside, there's all kinds of reporters and they want answers for me. And honestly, I don't even understand the questions that they're asking. But you know what, Kittredge? I figured out your plan. You just want to get the news media down here so that you could run for political office and make your way to Washington, D.C. and get a dark brown office with a swivel chair that leans back 45 degrees. You make me sick, Kitteridge. I love that he calls the office like a brown polished plastic office, which feels real 70s. Like, yeah, man, you're just in a neon cage, brother. <laughs> Yeah, your plastic fantastic lifestyle, you know, up on Madison Avenue. But in all seriousness, microplastics are a real problem. <laughs> Kittredge says, you can't talk to me that way. You're finished. Dismissed. Removed. You're officially on double secret probation. And then Ranger Kelly responds with two words. Up yours. It's <laughs> one of the finest up yours in cinema. You know, the greatest up yours ever. Was in Major League, where yeah. uh, up yours Joe Boo, where he yeah, up drinks yours the shot. Joe Boo, yeah, that's right up there. This is a great one because it's just there's so much ass to it blazing saddles is a quality up yours but that's not something we can repeat blazing saddles does have an interesting up yours that may be the funniest one for all the it's reasons. the most shocking for sure <laughs> in caddyshack there's a good up yours at the pool scene if you have an interesting up yours Send it to picksixmovies at gmail.com. Hashtag what's up yours. Subject line up yours, Bo and Chad, and we'll give you a shout out on an upcoming episode of Pick Six Movies. And you'll get a t-shirt. Not one from the show, just an old t-shirt I've got that doesn't fit anymore. The Ranger Kelly goes off to a Forest Ranger headquarters to smoke and drink some more. And yeah. bear expert Arthur Scott, he's hanging out, looking out the window. I think he's keeping an eye open to make sure that bear doesn't sneak up on him. And then Ranger Kelly, who is is drunk again he says you know scotty if this national forest was private land i'd be a bajillionaire first of all this is a buyer's market that's bullshit also if you're gonna sit there and just drink your old granddad all day that's fine but i'm going out there to catch a bear i think that bear expert arthur scott might just be a hermit who lives in the woods like no one's paying him for rooting around in the grass wearing a bear skin Oh, brother, I get it. That lifestyle is like eight years away. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm going to the woods, Chad. <sighs> Cut to the moment of this movie that, and I wrote this in my notes, has to be Bo's number one or number two favorite scene in the whole film. My notes begin... 
in the greatest scene of the movie. <laughs> there is a house, Chad. There is a house in the mountainside that's really near a bear. It's the next day, and we're in rural Appalachia, and there's a log cabin, and this Ma Engel type woman comes out, and she says, Look at here, Robert. You stay safe in the yard now. You hear? And then Robert, who's this pudgy six-year-old kid sitting in the dirt, he's petting a white rabbit. And then Robert shouts about at his mom, Yes, um. And Bo, we see our grizzly bear lumbering through the woods toward the backyard of this log cabin that does have a white picket fence around it. Yeah. And Robert, this little kid, he chases his rabbit that scurries under the picket fence, and he goes after the rabbit outside the picket fence and for a moment Bo I think holy shit are they gonna kill this kid but then <laughs> the kid gets in the gate just fine thank god right and you're like oh man what a, what a tease of a movie that Grizzly is pip it and then pip it Grizzly yells waka waka <laughs> and just busts into this backyard starts mauling this fucking kid <laughs> The mother sees this is like, my baby, and grabs a broom of all things, <laughs> rushes at Grizzly, who's like, this is it, cleaning day, waka waka, and then goes after the mother, bear attacks her, Arr. waka waka, what's red and pink and hanging out of the spare's mouth, that pudgy kid's leg, waka waka. The scene ends with the camera going into the Grizzly's mouth as it roars. This movie had me on the edge of my seat, right? from the very beginning because of the suspense no because i wanted to leave <laughs> <laughs> how dare you how dare you after this scene this scene doesn't sell you on this movie i don't know that there is a pulse in your body this movie is wonderful anyway let's cut to the hospital is it the hospital i think it's, it's just a, it's outside either, the house right uh, it's either the hospital or the, or the elk lodge whatever the, so it's <laughs> night it's raining everybody is standing around an at least hung over once more ranger kelly comes out of this house slash ranger station or whatever uh -huh. and it's just like I gotta tell you, I've seen a lot of disgusting things, and that was easily the thing that made me lose my lunch the quickest. It was a lot like drinking warm milk on a summer day. It's that level of disgust. Only imagine someone had thrown up a combination of oatmeal and peas. It's that kind of <laughs> texture and color mixture. That not Geraldo Rivera comes over and gets real confrontational with Ranger Kelly. And Kelly says, look here, not Geraldo Rivera. Somehow you're responsible for this as much as anybody. Well, except for me, because I'm not responsible for it. But you know what? That little boy, Bobby, I'm guessing that's his name, the pudgy kid that was attacked in the last scene. Well, part of him is still alive. And if we can get him to City Hospital in time to save his life, poor little bastard. All of that is actual dialogue from this movie. First of all, the fact that his name is Little Bobby is a real treat. But when someone says, oh, he's alive, and the response is, well, part of him is. There is this level of disgust of like, he'd be better off dead. Can you imagine that walking around with only one leg? The Gertie that's wheeled out of this elk lodge is covered with a bloody sheet <laughs> yes. that is draped over a small boy-sized human form beneath it. Clearly missing a leg. There is no question that Grizzly ate this kid's leg. <laughs> I think there's just a very good chance that Ranger Kelly didn't understand the diagnosis of death by bear when he was talking to that coroner slash clinic counter attendant. Man, this back to back of the bear attacking this mother and son combo with the wheeling this poor kid out <laughs> with his stumpy bloody leg. Oh, Chad, I love it so much. And then we cut uh, the whole rest of this movie is just the fucking best. Then we cut to Don. <laughs> And Ranger Kelly just throwing guns into the helicopter to go kill this bear now. It's an excessive amount of ammunition and guns, and one of which is a rocket launcher. They don't really talk about it, but there is a rocket launcher in the mix. Don does say, look at here, man. I was in Nam, and I must have killed like a hundred gooks with one of these here rocket launchers. See, we called them gooks so it wouldn't get personal, but you know what, man? It did get personal. Now, you know what? I'm a pacifist. I don't kill nothing no more. You know what? Let's talk about Scotty. That boy's weird. 
Dude, let me just highlight a couple of things you mentioned here. One is the fact that we get the only backstory I care about in this movie, which is the fact that Don is now this utter pacifist after Vietnam. Right. When he asks about Scotty, like, hey, where is that boy? And Rancher Kelly says, oh, he went off on his own out into the woods. He's out in the woods, romping around, wearing bear skins, probably laying on top of them, softly masturbating as squirrels and raccoons and other woodland creatures look on, gleefully, happily. His delivery of, you know, that boy's weird. I love it so much. Like I said, I've seen this movie any number of times, and his delivery of that line is genuinely very funny. Have you ever seen the director's cut of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the animated film? It's quite interesting. Most of the time, the dwarves are just running about in the forest, masturbating, having sex with one another as birds and deer, other woodland creatures looking on. It's fantastic. I've got a copy back at my house if you'd like to watch it. I hear too that Walt Disney himself approved it. So Scotty is now out on horseback in the forest. We see the chopper flying overhead. So uh-huh. all three of our heroes are now out in the woods, armed, after the bear the orca has left yes and inside the chopper don and kelly are talking about this bear of course ranger kelly just is opining about the motives of the bear especially as it happens with the mauling of the mother and child and he's like i don't know maybe the bear just wants to go home is that a thing bears like to do i really have no idea why it killed that mother and child or mauled the child i mean quite frankly just between you and me don would have been better if the boy had died i mean what a freak Am I right? I mean, look me in the eye and tell me that you'd want that for a son. So Don says, are you saying we're going to help this bear go home, son? And then the bear, Grizzly, seems to hear that. He's like, they're talking about me up there. And he just stands up on both legs and just, Waka waka. So Ranger Kelly and Don, they land the helicopter. And Ranger Kelly, he gets a gun. Don does not get a gun because he's a pacifist. And they somehow have a dead deer tied to a rope using the deer's antlers. And they string it up in a tree like bait. And the belly of the deer is gutted wide open. The whole thing looks like a far side cartoon in the making. My favorite part of this moment is as Don is dragging by a rope this carcass into the woods to string it up. Uh huh. Ranger Kelly is just like, boy, it is a lovely day out here. The fresh air, it really feels like my pores are opening up. And Don's just like, hey, man, you want to help me with this fucking deer? It's heavy as hell, man. <laughs> grab the rope. And I love that that's committed to film of, hey, man, come on, grab the rope. Quit fucking around. We got work to do. Uh, what a jerk this guy is. Back to Grizzly Chad. He is stalking. Yeah in the woods while our heroes are hanging up the deer it's the same idea as the bear cub really where they're gonna stake this thing up they're gonna hide in the blinds and and lay in wait and grizzly sees the deer he's like say look at that deer it looks delicious he gets close and then he pauses say wait a second seems like this deer is awfully convenient and then kelly cocks his rifle and as soon as he does it, Grizzly is like, ah, Kermit! <laughs> hauls ass, and then we get the adventure music kick in. Uh-huh. It's very unthrilling, though. If you thought those yes. yellow barrel scenes in Jaws were a good time to go take a piss, this really shows you how a movie can bore an audience to death. It's just shots cutting between bear running, mm. then Don and Ranger Kelly running, back to bear running, and repeat... And Until the bear just runs across a shallow stream. Say, man, that bear got away. We best head on back to the helicopter. Come on, man. I hope you're leading the way. Honestly, I wasn't paying attention. We could literally be anywhere. Honestly, if we ran into someone speaking a different language right now, I would not be surprised, Don. I don't understand distances. We cut to bear expert Arthur Scott. He's still riding around on his horse, so we don't forget about him being in this movie. Uh Uh-huh. And then Kelly and Dom somehow make their way back to the tree, and they find that our bear has snatched the dead deer, making these two look like a couple of assholes. Yeah. Say, man, this is one clever bear. He figured out that we were just tricking him with this dead deer. Again, because I'm just madly obsessed with the character of Don in this, Uh he has the best moment in this scene where he says, Say, man, when you stay up on watch tonight, making sure that bear don't kill us. If you fall asleep and you feel a cold, wet snout in your face, don't open your eyes, man, and kiss it back. 
because it ain't me. <laughs> and Rachel Kelly says, Don, I got to be honest. That's not funny. I don't I don't understand what any of that means. And Don's <laughs> response, Hanu got in the movie. He says, you know, you're right. And then just walks off and goes to bed. <laughs> How do you not want to be this person when you grow up? We'll talk about that after we finish the episode. <laughs> Fair so, enough. So the sun goes down and everybody goes to sleep, including bear expert Arthur Scott, who just camps out in the dark of night in the woods where there's a killer bear on the loose. I'm one with nature, okay? I don't need your tents and fires. According to the subtitles, we hear a little foreboding music. So it's the next day. Nobody got killed overnight. And we're at the helicopter and Dom and Kelly decide to head out to go hunt for the bear after the sun has come up and we get to hear a little foreboding music and the movie gives us a dolly zoom made famous by Alfred Hitchcock and Steven Spielberg in the movie Jaws where the camera's on a dolly and it's physically moved forward while zooming out to give the audience a sense of disorientation or in this movie a sense of are you fucking kidding me really <laughs> it's good Bill Gurdlow's right. a good director bear expert Arthur scott he gets on his horse to go off and trot around for a bit until he stumbles across the half-eaten deer from the day before that was used as bait so scott gets off his horse and he calls ranger kelly on his radio and he's like i'm in sector 7g sector 7g and ranger kelly says ah look i don't know anything about bears but if the dead animal we used to trick him is there and hear me out here that bear might be near you. You might be in danger. I saw what he did to that child, Billy. I mean, it was a mess. He snatched off his leg and one of his arms. It kind of looked like a couple of chicken wings and not the drumettes, the disappointing parts. That all sounds great. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tie this dead deer carcass to the back of my horse. I'm going to try to draw the bear down the mountain. And then you guys meet me halfway, okay? All right. Halfway to where? You know what? It doesn't matter. If you find the bear, scream uncontrollably and we'll head in that direction. I don't really think any of that's a good idea, Scotty. I don't know personally, but I'm looking right at Don and he's shaking his head to beat the band. He really seems energetic about this. And as far as I'm concerned, I really just don't want to make that trip this morning. How about you meet us all the way back down here and then we'll meet you no way up there. How does that sound? Scotty just hangs up. Okay, I'll see you guys in a little bit. Scotty is just making plans with friends that they don't agree to at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we're all gonna go see that new mortal Kombat movie in the theaters right no why would we do it's on hbo i mean i can watch it right here on my couch yeah but the theater experience am i right yeah but there's a whole painting we're okay i'll see you guys there at seven i've already bought tickets for all of us okay i'll be waiting for you out front we're not going i i'll leave them at the box office for you wear a mask it's required i can't wait to share some popcorn with you guys we're all vaccinated. It doesn't matter. They still require it. Our bear expert ties the dead deer to his horse. He trots around through the woods looking for the grizzly. And then, Bo, out of nowhere, our grizzly bear pops up, waka waka, and he lops the head off of this horse like he's got direct orders from Michael Corleone himself. It just lops the head off. It's terrific. Scotty rolls free of this now decapitated horse, but his rifle has gone skittering away into the brush. And Scotty makes for the rifle, but then Grizzly is like, not so fast. And then just gets Scotty. Scotty is dead, mostly. Kinda. Kind of like that Appalachian kid was partially alive. An affront to God and man, right. Don and Ranger Kelly are now in the chopper flying over as we see Scotty just tossed into a pit by Grizzly and covered with dirt and grass and shit. <laughs> Saving you for later. What do you get when you cross a bear with a garden? Squash. <laughs> waka waka. I wish I was a vegetable. A little later, <laughs> Scotty just wakes up and you get a nice shot of those beautiful blue Richard Jekyll eyes. Uh-huh. And he starts to drag himself out of this pit and wipe some shit off of him. He's like, uh, boy, that was a close one. And he gets out of this pit long enough to look up to see Grizzly there. Uh-huh. Just kidding. I was here the whole time. Rawr, waka waka. And Scotty has a real mother look on his face that is yep. s just choice a few minutes later ranger kelly and don they wander off and eventually make their way over to this mangled mess of blood and guts and dirt and grass and more guts say man how are we going to get him back and ranger kelly says get him back we're not getting him 
back. We would need maybe four or five garbage bags to do that. And I mean the industrial strength kind of garbage bags that promise no leaks and they keep that promise. Just grab a large chunk of him and we'll take that back as proof that we did something today. You know, I, I know this might be in bad taste, but they call it dead weight for a reason. I like Scotty and all, but he's heavy as hell. Grab his knit cap. That'll be enough. Take his deer skin. It's the only thing he really loved. They get back in the helicopter. They go airborne. And Don says, say, man, I've been thinking it over. And uh, come to think of it, I'm ready to kill something again. I was just funning earlier when I said that that dead guy was a weirdo who dressed up like animals and romped around the woods. Since we saw him dead and all smooshed up, I got a hankering to take another living creature's life. So let's look at the map. Maybe we should go where this bear committed his first kill. That seems to make no sense whatsoever. Meanwhile, Grizzly is literally standing in a clearing below them, waving. Hey guys, it's me, Waka Waka! I think you were looking for a grizzly. So Don flies in low and they give chase. The grizzly runs through the woods and he gets a little tuckered. And then he eventually appears again after his brief rest. We get more bear running, more helicopter flying. Dude, there is three or four minutes left in this entire movie at this point. It's shocking how little is left. I paused it at this moment and I was like, we got like 348 plus credits yeah yeah and in this moment as they're chasing grizzly don says say man all we gotta do is get on the ground and we can take that rocket launcher right there take it straight up that grizzly's ass man and richard kelly's like i don't know what any of that means but it sounds colloquial and charming and i say we do it flying around in this helicopter with you is like going to a cracker barrel it's satisfying and, and it's entertaining all at the same time. I know it's not good for me, but I love that hash brown casserole, Don. I know that's not what we're talking about, but listening to you talk and tell your stories, it's like eating hash brown casserole. That's the only way I can describe it. I said that to Allison earlier, and she looked at me dumbstruck. And I got a feeling that at the end of the day, the fact that I have that weirdo who liked to track bears, well, I've got his foot in my pocket. I got a souvenir. It's just like a day at the Cracker Barrel. I think I'm going to get some jam before I get home. Another way that this day is very Cracker Barrel-esque, Don. So they set this thing down in a clearing, and as they're landing, Grizzly immediately attacks the helicopter. Waka waka! There is a quick glimpse of a dude in a bear suit uh -huh. here that also just warms my heart. Mm -hmm. It's not a second. It's just long enough for you to get the impression of, oh my God, that was a guy in a bear suit. And it was the most fozzy that the bear looks in the movie. It's really wonderful. I may go out tomorrow if I can borrow or go to it. Oh. I'd step out in style for my senses smile and my dancing bear. <laughs> I'm so glad. Don't, we're not going to comment any further on it. If you got that <laughs> reference, immediately write to you. Bo and Chad at gmail.gov. <laughs> Grizzly is attacking the helicopter. Don gets just slung from the helicopter as it spins around. Kelly is inside looking up, you know, doing a real dramatic job of like, Oh shit! That's a very large bear, much larger than I expected. You know, Don, he's quite terrifying, but you've got this. Aim for his scrotum or his eye sockets, Don. Pretend he's one of those, what was that racist slur you used earlier? A goop? Pretend he's a goop, Don. Channel your Vietnam PTSD. Don, I don't want to leave the helicopter. It's safer in here for me. I'm just going to shout some positive affirmations to you, Don. Kill the bear! So Don, he recovers his rifle, he takes aim, he shoots the bear a few times. Say, man, take this. Hey, no shooting! <laughs> and turns on Don, charges at him. Don realizes he now has no ammunition. He has fired all of his bullets into Grizzly. Oh, man, it sure is a pickle. And so he just turns the rifle around like a club and just decides he's going to die a hero's death of dying on his feet here. During this scene, this movie has the balls to give us a second dolly zoom. Hey, so nice they zoomed it twice. 
You! The ball's on this guy. The fucking ball's on this this William Girdler. (laughs) Well, the grizzly bear comes over and grabs Dom and puts his arms around him and kills Dom with a bear hug. Uh Uh-huh. It's the most adorable death ever captured on film. Oh my god, that cannot be illegal! It is wonderful. Yeah, it is just a big hug and Don spits up a little blood and then he's he's dead. And Grizzly now turns his attention back to Ranger Kelly. Oh shit, he looks angry. Oh, I shouldn't have gotten out of this helicopter. That was a really poor decision on my part. I'm not going to lie to you. I I thought I was going to make a run for it while he was eating Don, but it turns out he's not hungry. He's just angry. Ranger Kelly then rushes over to the helicopter and retrieves the rocket launcher mentioned earlier. Uh Uh-huh. Kelly dashes off into this open landing. He drops to one knee, holding said rocket launcher, hopefully in the right direction. And this grizzly bear is now adorably on its hind legs. Look at me! Walking toward Ranger Kelly because this bear thinks he's people. (laughs) And Ranger Kelly fires this rocket launcher at this grizzly bear as the bear gives a final waka waka. And Ranger Kelly says, die, you, I mean, stop living, you son of a bitch. (laughs) Smile, you bastard. Grin, you son of a Greskin. Dude, and then this bear blows up like the Death Star. It's like a watermelon full of M.A. This bear is gone. Like, (laughs) gone, gone. There is no proof left that he killed this bear. By the time somebody found it, even the chunks would be taken away by scavengers. Ranger Kelly just stands alone, the sole survivor, as a large bear-sized patch of forest burns openly. That's clearly a fire safety hazard out in the woods. The one thought on his mind is, I honestly have no idea how I'm getting down. I don't know how to fly that helicopter. I thought it was a plane until Don corrected me. And I certainly don't know my way through the woods. I guess I could just go down. That's probably my best bet because that's really the only direction I'm familiar with. I could put the barrel of this rocket launcher in my mouth and commit a level of suicide never before seen on planet Earth, but that seems a bit short-sighted. Yeah, it, I mean, he looks kind of pensive, stares at the camera, roll credits, done and done. End of Grizzly, 90 minutes, in and out. Life's like a movie, write your own ending, blow up a bear with a rocket launcher. We've done just what we've set out to do. Thanks to Peter Benchley, Steven Spielberg, and you. The end. Yeah, what a way to start this season, Chad. <laughs> I mean, these are some dizzying highs. I, is this the best movie we'll watch this season? Maybe. I don't know, man, because I know what's coming up on our next episode, and it is a real treat. It is the 1980 slightly satirical horror film Alligator, which was written by the very talented John Sayles, who also wrote the incredibly entertaining film Piranha, Mm -hmm. a movie considered for this season of Pick 6 Movies, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in two weeks. And Alligator was also directed by Louis Teague, a guy who directed the movie Cujo, which was another movie pitched for this season of Pick 6 Movie, but was not selected. We'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks. And that movie stars Robert Forrester, who went on to appear in... Jackie Brown, a movie that was not considered for this or any other season of Pick 6 movies, because that's a good film. Yes. Yeah, before we get into Alligator, I have to ask you, <laughs> uh-huh. what as someone who had never seen this movie before, what was your takeaway from Grizzly as a, a virgin to those woods? It is clearly a Jaws ripoff. Down to the costumes and everything, but it's all scrambled up in ways that it's very badly done. The kid who gets mauled is wonderfully shocking. And I cannot express to you how my jaw dropped into my lap when this dude pulled out a rocket launcher (laughs) and blew up this bear. Uh It's, It's indescribable. Yeah, I would recommend watching this. It is currently free on Amazon Prime if you pay for that. And I would recommend watching it. If any of this sounded entertaining, you've never seen it. The movie is just a fantastic Jaws. And it's only 90 minutes. It's a quick in and out. Like you were saying, towards the end of this movie, you're going to be like, how much more is this? 10 minutes? What? And when that bazooka happens, the reaction everyone has is, 
What? Yes! It's pretty bonkers, you know? I am so glad we started the season with this. I'm looking forward to Alligator. I love Alligator as well. This is a season just made for for me as a person. I know. I know. This was a gift from me to you. Yeah. So 